Hey, guys and girls. So with the last segment here of class, uh, wanted you guys to uh, get a little bit of lab experience with uh, the topic we've been working on, which is calculating percent comp. So we'll do a little talk just about a review of some things so far, and then I'm going to walk you through the lab in the back. You guys can observe, uh, see what's going on. All right. So what we're trying to accomplish in this lab is exactly what you've been doing with these like hypothetical problems. Right? I want to calculate what the percent composition of a substance is. And there's three different ways we can do that. Right? The three ways we talked about it in class right, all involve little over the big. So anytime you want to get a percent composition, just remember it's little over the big. Right? Now, who the little is and who the big is can vary. Right? If the simplest version, the little is an individual element, and the big is a compound. I want to figure out how much carbon is in carbon dioxide. I want to figure out how much oxygen is in water, right? That's one way. Things can get more complicated as you have mixtures. Say I'm um, outside testing samples of the soil. I want to see, you know, if there is a rich enough a component to mine in a area. I want to see, can I mine for copper here? So I dive down in, I grab a sample of this ore, which has a bunch of junk attached to it. And I would do mass of the element, copper, over mass of the ore, the impure sample. And sometimes that could be an element over not just a compound, but a couple of compounds. Sometimes I might be mining for a compound, right? I'm going to mine for shale. Right? That's a compound. So it would be grams of a compound over grams of an ore. And then the last version we talked about in class was you could do a hydrate. Right, Some compounds naturally tend to bind with water from the air. So they float around with all these waters attached to them. So we could do grams of the pure compound without water divided by grams of the hydrated compound. And we could figure out what percentage of that compound is um, unhydrated. Right, now, for general chemistry land, I tend to focus on the just element over the compound when we do these guys. All right, so if we take a look, I have a compound sitting in the back called potassium chlorate. With the potassium chlorate, right, our goal is to figure out how much oxygen is in that guy. So if I were going to write a percent composition equation for that, the percentage of oxygen should be grams of the little, grams of oxygen, over grams of the big, which is the whole compound, the potassium chlorate, times 100. Also, just like in class, there's two different percentages we can calculate. The theoretical percentage, based on potassium chlorate's formula, how much of it is supposed to be oxygen. And the experimental, when I go in the back and actually determine it, what is my experimental percent of the oxygen? How do we get each of those? So if I ask you to calculate a theoretical percent composition, right, all your numbers come from the periodic table, and you have to know the formula of the compound right, so that you can account for how many atoms of each there are. You don't need to do a single thing in the lab to calculate the theoretical percent comp. You could do it simply based on the formula of potassium chlorate, which I'll give you here in a moment. Experimental does exactly what it says. We need to do an experiment to gather that data. So all of your numbers for your calculations come from your laboratory data. You don't need to need the formula, right? So I don't have to know what potassium chlorate's formula is, and I don't want to use its formula as part of my calculation. I will do everything from numbers from the balance in the back, all right, not from the periodic table. All right, so like I said, if we want to do this, right, theoretically, I would need to know what my formula for potassium chlorate is to do theoretically. Potassium chlorate is KClO3, right? No prefixes, all right? So we know we're doing symbols and charges in crossing. Potassium is in group one, chlorate ends in A-T-E, so it's a polyion. It's a one, you cross them down and you reduce. Right? 
there's a reaction where if I heat potassium chlorate, I can get it to decompose. I heat the thing up and it shakes hard enough so that a portion of it breaks away. Right now, it won't break down into all its elements individually, which is good because chlorine by itself is toxic. Right? But we can heat this guy up where the potassium chlorate, if you look into your uh, pre-lab packet, our Bunsen burner can get hot enough to decompose this, but it doesn't get hot enough to decompose the potassium chloride, which is good for us. So this is going to allow us to isolate the oxygen. All right, now, you're going to see in your packet that this guy has some numbers in front. We're going to get to that, and we've touched on it a little bit this year. All right? But remember, we aren't allowed to create or destroy atoms. So we need to make sure we have the same number of potassiums and chlorines on both sides and the same number of oxygen. That's what those coefficients are for. It is not going to affect anything about your experiment. It's not going to affect anything about your calculation. Right? The only thing that it is going to do right, is make sure it matches up with what we know is important later in the next chapter. All right, so we're going to do two different things as part of this experiment. We are going to calculate the theoretical percentage of oxygen in this guy, which we'll do um, while we're waiting for the reaction to occur. And we're going to do the experimental percentage of oxygen. Right? And from that, we're going to be able to assess how well our lab went. We can calculate our percent error right, based on how close those two numbers are. All right, so how is this going to work? All right, well, if you... Take a look at the equation. Here's the pieces you don't know that you'll have experience with when we're done. KClO3 is a white solid. Because it's a solid, I can measure how heavy it is. I can measure its mass using the balance. KCl is a white solid. So I'm able to measure how heavy it is using the balance. Oxygen is a clear, colorless gas. So what's going to happen is as I heat the KClO3, I am going to convince the oxygen to leave the compound. So this is kind of unique in the sense that I need to measure how much <laughs> oxygen there is, the grams of oxygen for this problem. Uh, but you're going to say, well, how do you catch the oxygen? It's a gas that's leaving. And the answer is, is we're not, right? This is one of those instances. I can know how much oxygen was in this guy by how much missing mass there is. Because I know whenever I heat this thing up, the part that stays behind the solid is the potassium and the chlorine. And the part that went away is the oxygen. So my missing mass is due to oxygen. Right, to give you like a simple everyday example, if I got on the scale, right, and it said I weighed 180 pounds, you know, four weeks ago, right, and then I worked out and it says I weigh 172 pounds now, you know I lost eight pounds, right? Well, how do you know it's not there anymore? Because the missing mass had to be the weight that left. Same principle as guidance. All right, so what I'm going to talk you through here is in the lab experimentally, how are we going to do that? All right, so if we're going to do that, I'm going to talk to you about some lab equipment. All right, we are going to use a crucible, all right? And from way back when at the beginning of the year, a crucible is something that we use to heat solids, right? So I'm going to take a crucible, which is a metal-looking cup with a lid. And I'm going to measure how heavy it is by itself. So we're going to measure that thing empty. Then what we're going to do is we're going to put about two grams of potassium chlorine into it. It doesn't even matter if that's what it says on the balance because I'm going to measure its mass again. The crucible, the lid, and the KClO3. 
we'll have some white solid in here. That's the KClO3. Then, like I said, we're going to heat this guy. We're going to heat him to about 400 degrees. All right. When we heat him, he's going to decompose. So I'm going to have a crucible at the end, and there's still going to be white solid in there, but now the white solid is the KCL, and we're going to see how heavy that is. Crucible, the lid, and the KCL, because I know that the oxygen gas has left. And in your data table, there will be numbers for all of these guys. So I will pivot back up here, all right, and we will fill these things in, and I'll talk you through it in your data table, all right, of what these numbers are. And then when we work through them, you will have an idea of how to uh, gather the information. All right, so I'm going to take you guys back into the lab. All right, and first thing I would do is I'm going to take down my ring stand with my iron ring on it. We're going to be using this for heating. Okay. Get out my Bunsen burner. Get over here. Get myself a crucible and my lid. All right, now, if we start walking through the procedure, which I'll uh, share with you uh, on the screen, and we'll try to go back and forth. Uh, the first thing it tells me to do is to heat this guy strongly for two minutes. We want to make sure there's nothing uh, on this or in this, uh, no water, nothing like that. Okay, All right, so I'm not even going to get the mass of it yet because I want to make sure if there's any junk on it, it goes away. All right, so to do that, I'm going to go into my drawer. And I'm going to get out my pipe stem triangle. I'm going to check my gas. It's like we have good gas there. Plug in my Bunsen burner. Okay. Bit of a review, right? Hopefully we'll all be back together soon. Right? With your Bunsen burner, close the windows. So all the gas will go straight up to the top of the burner. Go in here. Get out your striker. Right, turn your gas on. Okay, it's been a while since we used the gas. I might be flushing some oxygen out. All right, so we'll give that a second. Turn on some valves. All right, in the meantime, well, I'm waiting to flush out a little bit of air in the gas lines there. All right. When I handle my crucible, I want to always use my crucible tongs, my wire gauze, right, so that I can always grab the crucible like this and move it as a singular unit like this. And then the lid could always stay on the side. Okay. All right. So if my nose is smelling correctly, I think we're good with our methane. There we go. All right. So I'm going to take this over here and I'm going to turn it sideways so you guys can see. All right. Looks like we have a good height there. All right. Just taking my crucible. Putting it in here. Taking my lid. And putting the lid on top. And just so you guys can see, notice here with my lid, I'm always leaving a little bit of a crack on the lid so that 
Uh, if there is any substance that's trying to burn away, it has somewhere to go. All right, so we're going to let that heat for two minutes. And just like always, right, I've done this ahead of time. So uh, I know it's already pre-cleaned, right, but we would have let it go for two minutes. All right, now, from this point on, my Bunsen burner all right, is uh, heated this to the point it's far too hot to touch with my hands. And furthermore, I don't want to touch it much because any of my skin that gets on there is going to affect the mass. Right, but we need to go get the mass of this guy. Right, so I'm going to take my lid, move it off. Always bring your wire glass up close. Grab your crucible and your tongs. Ease over to here. We'll let that sit for just a second. I'm turning on the balance. And it goes through its checklist. And the first thing I'm doing is just getting the mass of the empty crucible with the lid. All right, this is the first number you guys are going to put into your data table. All right, so if I share my screen with you guys. In your packet, we just performed step one, heat the clean dry crucible on the pipe stem triangle uh, for two minutes. And then it says using the beaker tongs, clamp, transfer the clean crucible uh, to let it cool. And then once it's cool, weigh it and record the number in the data table. Uh, data table say you, this data table. All right, so we're filling in the one that says mass of empty crucible and cover right now, the very top line of our data table. Right, that number is 24.82. Right, so 24.82 grams is the number that needs to go onto the top line of that table. All right, so if I go over here, you can type that so that we have it. So then we go back up to our procedure. We are now into step four. Is using a plastic weighing dish, mass out approximately two grams. Anything between 1.90 and 2.10 would be just fine. Right? And we're going to transfer it into the crucible. We really don't care what that number is because we're going to measure the crucible with the white powder, the potassium chlorate in it, just in case anything gets stuck. All right, and I'll show you what I mean by that. All right, so let you guys see what's going on here again. All right, I'm going to come over here. Here is my potassium chlorate. Like I said, just the white salt. Right, I'm going to take my crucible off the burn, off the balance. Right, and then I'm going to take an empty weighing dish. I'm going to put that on there. And then I'm going to zero that out. I'm going to hit zero, and that tells the balance to remove the weight of the dish from it. And I'm going to add enough white solid into this guy right, to get between 1.90 and 2.10. And honestly, even if it was outside that range, it wouldn't make a big deal. All right, but I'm going to go ahead and transfer that. All right, so like I said, I don't even really care. That was a ballpark number, All right? So my balance is 2.17. So for me, that's close enough because all I really care about, all right, is making sure I get about that much into the crucible. All right, so I'm going to come over to here and I'm going to transfer it into the crucible. And this is why we do this. What you are going to see when I do this is on that dish, there is white solid still coating some of this dish. And if I tapped it, you'd see it fall. All right. That means not all of my 2.17 that the balance said I had made it into the crucible. This is why we do the empty crucible. Then we do the crucible 
the white solid in the lid so we know exactly how much white solid was in there. All right, so I'm going to take that substance back over to the balance. I have to zero the balance out again because now the dish isn't on there, so I have to reset my balance. And now I'm going to move my crucible with its lid onto this. And we're going to get our second number for the table. All right, so now if we go back to our table, We are now filling in this box, the mass of the crucible, the cover, and the potassium chlorate before I have heated it. All right, so that number is 26.96. All right, so 26.96 grams. All right, so now we got our... Crucible empty and our crucible with the potassium chlorine. Right. What that means is you can now tell me from process of elimination how much potassium chlorate made it in, right? Because the difference in mass between the crucible, the cover, and the potassium chlorate and the crucible and the cover hum, be, hum, must be how much white solid made it in. All right. And I'm going to walk you through those mini calculations. All right when uh, we're waiting for our compound to heat up, all right? But if I take you back up to our procedure, right, we are now to the point where we're gonna place the crucible on the pipe stem triangle. We're gonna adjust the cover so that gas can escape. And then we're gonna heat the sample all right, uh, for gently two minutes and then strongly for 20, all right? And like I said, whenever we move our crucible in our lid, we always do it with the iron ring and the or the goss bar goss nearby. So I keep them nice and close. I'm gonna put that up there. I'm gonna take my lid and I'm gonna keep the lid ajar just like I showed you before. And the whole point is we gotta let that oxygen escape. We need somewhere for it to go. But we want the lid on because we don't want anything to splatter out that's not the oxygen. Because if we lose that mass, that's a big source of error as we go through. All right, so I'm going to take my burner out, turn it on again. We're going to heat that right there on the bottom. All right, and this is going to go for right, 20 minutes. And show you guys what's happening. Heating the crucible on the bottom. If I'm quiet, hopefully you can hear some of that hissing and bubbling. Sorry about that. And you're going to start to see like, some gas leaving that substance. That gas is the oxygen. All right, so my 20-minute mark uh, just started. All right, and during that time, I'm going to walk you guys through some of these calculations uh, that you see. All right, so take you back up front. We have some numbers from what we've done. We now know the crucible and the cover, and we know the crucible, the lid, and the KClO3. We got those. All right, so if I head back to our data table, right, we have those numbers right there. So we know our crucible and cover was 24.82 grams. 
I know my crucible, my cover, and my potassium chlorate was 26.96 grams. Uh, so in your data table, there are stars next to certain boxes. What a star means is that you must do some math problem, usually just a subtraction, to get what the value of that box is going to be. You don't read it off of a balance. Right, so this one here, this one here, this one here, this one here, and this one here, and lastly, this one here, all have stars. That means you need to do supporting math work to get those, and that's a big part of your lab format. If you take a look at this guy, all right, we've got the lab format telling you what should your report include. So you're going to have a title, you're going to have a purpose, you're going to have a material list. All right, procedure, you don't need to do. That's just in the packet. So don't worry about the procedure. Your data and calculation section, the first thing are those star calcs that I'm talking about. All right, so you would have to have a calculation for a box. Right, that has a star in it, every single one, even if it's a subtraction. Right? One of those boxes is the percent comp of the KCLO3 theoretical, which we'll talk about. One of them is the percent comp KCLO3 experimental, and then our percent error, and then our five-part conclusion. All right, so right now, we can do one of our star boxes, and we can do our theoretical percent comp. But I'm going to talk you through how to get the other ones, because we're killing some time, so that you know what to do after the fact. All right, so the one we can get right now is I can calculate the mass of the KCLO3. Right, so if I want to get grams KCLO3, like I said, what I need to do is take the crucible, the lid, and the KCLO3 mass minus the crucible and the lid. Because if you take a look, the difference between those two right, is going to simply be the mass of the KCLO3. So you want to show that subtraction, right? And that final number is going to go into your data table, and then you'll have a separate page for your star calculation. All right, so that's how we'll get the grams of KCLO3. All right. Now, I'm going to talk to you theoretically, how do I get the other ones, right? Because I can't get them just yet because I don't have my lab date for it. All right, so, and I'm just going to jump up here because I think it might be a bit easier for you guys to see. All right, the next box says mass of the potassium chloride produced. So what you have to do is decide, okay, where do I have the potassium chloride? All right. And if I'm scanning, hey, it looks like I have potassium chloride here at the end, which is why I don't have the number yet. But if I want to get the grams of the potassium chloride, I'm going to want to take the crucible, the lid, and the KCL, which is what's there after heating, so after you heat it, it is the KCL, minus the crucible and the lid, right? Take a look. Crucible, crucible, lid, lid. The only difference between those two values, which will be this guy, which we're going to get at the end of our 20 minutes, and the crucible and the cup. All right, so that's how you would get the KCL. All right, lastly, how do I get the oxygen? There's two different ways you could get the oxygen. All right, way number one is you could realize that here I have the crucible, the lid, the K, the CL, and the O. Here I have the crucible, the lid, the K, and the CL. The only difference between here and here is the missing oxygen. There would be one way to do it. The other way you could do it was you did a star calc where you knew what your KCL weighed. 
you did a star calc where you knew what your KCLO3 weighed. The difference between those will also be the mass of the oxygen that left. So I'll show you both math problems and you decide which one makes sense. So if I want to get the grams of oxygen, which remember, that's what this is all about. We need the grams of oxygen to do our percent composition problem. I could do the crucible, the lid, and the KClO3, which is this guy right here, minus the crucible, the lid, and the KCL, which is this guy here. And look, crucible, crucible, lid, lid, K, K, CL, CL. The only difference between those is the oxygen we got to leave the compound. That would work just fine. Like the other way you could do it is you have the numbers without the crucible and the lid. So the other method would be grams of oxygen. Could just be the grams of KClO3 minus the grams of the KCL. And that will get you the same thing. Look, KCL, KCL, just the oxygen that's there. All right, so that's how you guys are going to uh, do the star calcs for... Um, the first few boxes in this portion right here. All right, so it'll be a subtraction. It'll be a subtraction. It'll be a subtraction. All right, now we're into, all right, the theoretical percentage of oxygen. And way back at the beginning of the lab, look, I said the theoretical percentage of the oxygen all the numbers come from the periodic table, and the numbers in the formula are important. Right? So what that means is you could do that problem right now. And when we're in the lab, that's exactly what I have you do, because we're waiting 20 minutes for our compound to decompose. But if we just need the periodic table, we can do this. Right? I'm not going to do it for you. For the oxygen, what I'm going to show you is how uh, I would get the theoretical all right, percent, I'll do the chlorine so you can see the system and then you apply the oxygen. So if I want to get the percentage of chlorine, what I would do is take the grams of the Cl divided by the grams of the KClO3 times 100. The numbers come from the periodic table and the numbers in the formula are important. All right, so I would go here. I'm going to take one times CL. Why one? Because there's only one CL in the formula. When you do it, you'll have to use the three oxygens. All right, so you'll take three times oxygen's number from the table. Right, I'm going to take one times chlorine's, and its number is 35.45 grams from the table. For the bottom, I need grams of the whole thing. So I'm going to have to take one times the CL, one times the K, and three times the O, and add those all up, right? Three, because there's a three for the O, right? So that math looks like 35.45 plus 39.10 plus three times the 16. And if I do that, I end up getting 122.55. Now, that actually is going to be a freebie for you because to show that to you, uh, it would be the same for your problem. Now, just let me double check those numbers. That was just me from memory there. So 35.45 plus 39.10. And we were good, 122.55. All right, so now I just finish out the problem. My 35.45 divided by my 122.55 right, times 100. And I determined that 28.93% of this compound is chlorine. Right, you guys will have to do the same task, but instead of chlorine, I need you to do oxygen. Oxygen, like I said. 
oxygen's number, and that number is going to be a three to help you guys out of it. All right, so work on that calculation. You finish that up, all right? Talking you through how do I get the experimental percentage of the oxygen? The same exact way except you're going to use all of your experimental data. All right, so once I get my final number, I will know the experimental grams of oxygen from the lab, and I know the experimental grams of potassium chlorine, which, remember, was this guy minus this guy. All right, so, again, you don't use the periodic table for that, and you don't multiply the oxygen by three, you just get what its mass was from your star calculation box, which is the one that's highlighted right there that says mass of oxygen driven off. All right, last but not least, quick review on how do I get percent error. All right, I want to get my percent error. There's an equation, right? Percent error. is equal to A minus E over A times 100, and that's an absolute value. Remember, the A is the accepted, which is also called the theoretical percentage. That's the problem I just tasked you guys with solving. So whatever you calculated for this guy here, and to give you uh, an idea, it should be just under 40%, FYI. That's your accepted. Your experimental is what you calculated here. All right? So you'll just plug that in for the A and the E, and you guys will solve. The lower that number is, the better the experiment went for you guys. All right? What are some things that might make that go wrong. Anything that messed with my mass is a source of error in this experiment because everything was measuring the balance. So if I underheat my substance and not all the oxygen leaves, there's a source of error. If I spill some of my solid when I'm trying to mass it, or some splattered out during the heating process. There is a source of error because it's going to make my crucible lighter or heavier than it was supposed to be. If some water reattached from the air, that would have made it heavier than it was supposed to be. These are all sources of error. All right, so let me take you to the back and let's finish up uh, gathering our data for the experiment. So this guy in the back's been heating, all right, and time-wise, yep, we're right around where we need to be. Yeah. So if you take a look, you guys got to pass on one of the more boring parts of this. I'm going to put you here. I'm going to turn my burner off. I'm going to go grab my goggles. <laughs> All right, and for this part of the experiment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a mass of my crucible and my lid. I'm going to write that number down on a little side piece of paper. Then what you do is you reheat, cool, and mass again for two minutes. You just heat for two, cool, mass. You repeat that process till you get the same number twice. Here is why. You know from beginning to end that it's supposed to get lighter because the oxygen's leaving. If I reheat it, mass it, and it keeps getting lighter, it means there's still oxygen leaving. I'm not done yet. But if I get the mass of it, reheat it, cool it, and get the mass again, and those numbers are the same, it means there's no more oxygen to leave. It's the indicator that you're done with the decomposition process. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get my original mass here. All right, and remember, this would be incredibly hot. So I'm going to take this guy. Put them here, reach down in here, grab this, move these over as a unit. All right. 
Let that cool for just a moment. Right, why we need to let that cool is as crazy as it sounds. Right, if I put that really hot crucible on the balance too fast, it heats up the air underneath that plate. Right, and light air, hot air rises. Right, so it will lift that dish just a little bit, and I will get an artificially low weight. All right, so we got to let it cool so we can't superheat the air underneath to make a convection current is what that's called. All right, so we let that cool for a minute with this guy up here. And remember, my original mass of that guy was 2696. Now I'm clocking in at 2620, right? So I know some oxygen left. But like I said, 2620 is just the number I'm writing down on a little separate sheet of paper. All right, what I need to do is reheat this guy. And you can reheat it without the lid. Because by this point in the experiment, most of what would need to leave is leaving. Right, and we would reheat this guy. We'd go two minutes and generally this process is consistent because uh, 20 minutes is a bit more than you need. That way you don't have to keep reheating it. So when I have you guys measure for 20 minutes, right, the decomposition really could probably happen in like 12 to 15. That extra couple minutes ensures all the oxygen is gone. All right. So if I would go back. Bring my wire gauss up, move this guy over again. Gotta let it cool just half a beat. All right, and then hopefully when I put that guy up on there, it's gonna say 2620, All right? And when it does, that means we're done. If it says 2618, there's still oxygen leaving. We go back up, the heat, cool, put it on. If it says 2621, we're actually done as well. It means that water has started attaching right, from the air, right? which means if it starts to get heavier again, that means you're done as well. All right, so let's take a peek and see where we are. That guy up there. Okay. Get the lid, right? It's always important you don't get the lid. Oh, and sure enough, 2620 all right, is what we're reading there. Just to show you I'm not a liar, 2620. Right. Uh, as we go. All right, so you guys can now go and fill in that last part of your data table that you need for the experiment. And the rest of this will be calculations. So if we go in here, percent comp, one more time, right? Filling in my last unstarred box is 2620 grams. Right. And everything else in here is a star calculation. Do those star calculations on a separate sheet of paper. Right. And one more time, just as a reminder, you need a title, a purpose, materials. Don't worry about the procedure. Your star calculations, which will include your percent comps. All right. So um, A is really just the first stars with the subtractions. And then B and C and D are the rest of the stars. So that's all the star calcs. And then your five part conclusion. I, I just need one lab report from you and your partners. All right. Um, as I'll mention in class before we get rolling, third nine weeks, you get to choose your partner. All right. So I'll just have people go in a random order, say who they want to be with. Uh, it can be anybody, including somebody you worked with before, because I chose them. So if you want to be with the same exact person you had for the second nine weeks, that's totally fine. All right, which we'll talk about. All right, so hopefully you guys get a good feel and you get good results here for your percent calculations of your oxygen. And I will be running around in the uh, respective breakout rooms to check in on you guys. All right, see ya.